Also als wir heute Morgen hierher gefahren sind, äh, sagte der Taxifahrer, die, die erlauben, erlauben sich, sich zu viel. viel. Zu viel. Zu viel. Zu viel. Mit dieser ganzen Informatik. Nein, nein, die Informatiker mit ihrem Internet. Jetzt hast du, ich wollte jetzt... Habe ich dir jetzt den Joke kaputt gemacht? Ja, gut. Viel Spaß bei den Security Nightmares. Hallo? Hallo? Seid ihr alle da? <lacht> wir haben noch vier Minuten, bevor es losgeht. Oder wir fangen einfach früher an. Oder? Oder wir machen die ganze Zeit Android-Witze. Dies sind nicht die Updates, nach denen ihr sucht. Okay. Schön. Schaut euch noch mal um. Genau, genießt den Saal noch mal. Ihr dürft nichts mitnehmen. Ne? Das, also nicht, nicht wir, wir sollen es hier besenrein übergehen. Und das heißt, so wie es jetzt ist, nicht als Parkplatz. Das machen die dann schon selber mit dem Parkplatz. <lacht> genau. And I guess I can already ja, welcome you to the translation for the, this edition of um, Security Nightmares. Your interpreters, interpreters tonight are going to be Zibalis and myself, Waffle, and we'd be very grateful for feedback for this talk and all others that we translated. You can tweet them to us at C3Lingo or using the hashtag C3T. And you can also reach us by email at hello at c3lingo.org. So, as in real life, progress converges towards zero. Okay, nice that you've all made it again and that you survived four days of Congress. I did not hear anything about a terrible disease this year. Well, let's hope that's true. Congress flu. Uh, and obviously you all made it away from home and away from the uh, IT maintenance marathon at home. Who of you over the holidays still <clears throat> had to delete a Windows XP installation? You are the heroes. Who was prevented from deleting one? Well, that's too many. That is too many. Who actually managed to get their family flash free? <coughs> okay. And the rest Google Chrome will deal with in the next year, I guess. And who made it to Java free? Well, more difficult, not that many. I think Oracle is actually working on it. They started with getting in the cache, right? Oracle is working on it, yeah. We are not going to announce that we are not serious about all that we are going to say. Well, you know, everything somehow dissolves into real satire, life imitating satire. Also, our image editors didn't quite manage, so we came up with just one that symbolizes the year 2016. Right. Just mind the camping chairs there in the foreground. Because actually, uh, when the world burns, it kind of looks nice, meditative, right? Looking into the flames, right? The advantage with having just an image of it, you don't have the smelly part of it. 
your factory one, right? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, well, okay, we'll just keep on going. Uh, we're not evil about Android here. We're not going to make any more Android jokes. It's, it's the platform used by billions, and that makes it relevant. And that's when things like this, these Qualcomm chip bugs in the LTE-capable Androids really bite. Uh, there were, what, 900 million devices affected, and just a fraction of those still receive updates. And then there was this ad banner clicker. How many million was that? 90? Roughly, so that immediately gets us to real stuff. And that's how the economy works. Someone has to click those banners, and well, if you automize that, the, tro the chosen Trojans will do that. So, I actually, I'm, it's strange to me that it's, it isn't the servers that click those banners. I still need those end devices. Imagine clients at an ISP that don't do anything but click. Do you mean a firewall? Yeah, a clicking firewall. Maybe um, there's a potential there, maybe. Okay, and uh, this year the difficulty of choosing electronics, even if you ask around in the family and friend circles, that has become harder, right? What do you think? Who thought that it's become easier to recommend something? Nokia 3310, that will always do, yes, I agree with that. Although, there are some China fakes of that too. Well, just buy nothing, yeah, that's, that's, that works. But you don't get many friends that way, strangely enough, because they're all itching to buy. What I would like is a vulnerability barometer for the 10 most sold smartphones every year, where you then can check uh, how open they still are. And, well, I guess that's asking too much. You mean risk level 5 display? Well, that is a kind of an inside joke. How is that defined, risk level 5? Do you know? How is it defined? Translator knows. We'll ask the German Agency for Internet Security in January. Actually, I was promised in the corridors uh, by people concerned uh, that an expansion would be forthcoming. There was this remarkable thing, a product warning from the BSI, the Federal Agency on Internet Security on routers, Netgear, plastic routers apocalypse, yeah. And yeah, that is remarkable, yeah. So what did it look like 10 years ago? We've been doing this for a while now, so looking back 10 years, the archives are still there. Nothing's even been depublished as public broadcasters need to do. We call for more transparency in politics because these are problematic, problematic groups uh, or remarkable sociotopes, as I think we called them. And what I think we should have said was we didn't mean nudes, nude pictures. Although, well, at least uh, this year we had quite a lot of politics transparency. The German parliament was very transparent this year. Yeah, diverse. The, the next thing we announced was the self-service house search. Uh, we thought of cute little dog robots uh, infected with state Trojans and having cameras in their eyes going through flats, and interestingly, that wasn't even required, because apparently everyone, hello Alexa, they have their own digital assistants. Who of you found something like that under the Christmas tree? 
Well, you don't. You have to ask it differently. Who knows someone who? Ah, yeah, a few, but not that many. Why? who at home found a TV set that can listen. Yeah, it does happen. Camera is an old thing. With the microphone is the new thing. And who then has to treat those with the drill? And no one's staring yet. It's actually quite a difficult task these days because all these different parts in there these days. So who looks when buying new hardware, whether there's a microphone in it? Very good. Still not enough, but quite good. So um, the self-service house search. And then in that one case that went through the press, interestingly, of course, Alexa is in the forefront, uh, at the forefront, and someone added some details about the water counter, that the water meter, the Internet of Things water meter that tells you where and when particularly large amounts were used. That was between 1 and 3 a.m., which is kind of unusual to have lots of water getting used. And then there were corpses in the bathtub or something, and that was strange. Oh, it was about the blood traces or something. Okay. So at least that brings us to devices that snitch on us, snitching hardware with an IP address. In Germany, you had these Aldi IP camps, uh, IT tents, I think. No one knows how many of those are still around without being patched, having been patched. Who of you knows? Well, no, let's leave it. Right. And then the plastic routers, that's something everyone heard about. That again was how many hundreds of thousand? 900,000. Right. And what is your Mira share at home? Right. Okay. So, 10 years ago, device driver security, that was relevant, it keeps popping up. And this year, there was the example about a signed device driver that contained some bug so that other device drivers could be loaded, unsigned ones as well, so that still isn't dead. And the good news here is that I think Microsoft uh, with these roll-up patches, they, they start with those and they no longer give users a choice to pick which patches you want. Funny, and, and if the HTTP won't work afterwards, or to look at it the other way around, is that device then really safe? Yeah, the plastic router apocalypse, yeah, standard passwords. As we had it 10 years ago, and again popped up this year, and in partly, of course, it's so frustrating how security-relevant infrastructure manufacturers deal with these things. They push out a quick update, as you would expect, and in that update, there's a better standard password with more special characters. Applause. Yeah. Wow. We called it computer espionage and industry 4.0. Computer-aided industry espionage has turned into industry 4.0. So the question was 10 years ago, if you could stand in front of the Opal Works and then from the parking lot configure your car using the Wi-Fi there, and the answer is not yet possible, but the industry is working on it hard. We'll get to that. 
Yeah, Lan in well, it's it's increasing the the IoT being embedded into cars and things. And who of you knows the ape cribs that you need with these displayless devices? It's the the standard thing of of something that accepts telnet or whatever is the the ape crib the key combination you need to set a device's service mode and i saw a few raised hands there it's this service mode topic and also easter egg topic and many technologies only allow for easter eggs once the technology reaches a certain level of complexity and while I was waiting at a red light, I wondered about the about the the buttons, about the, the it was probably good. I'm sure you could uh, tap a, a very nice rhythm, but they were probably so simple that you couldn't hide any nice things in them, unless somebody wants to take the microphone and prove me wrong. And now there are these inductive buttons at red lights, and I suspect that their resolution is not quite as good. It's probably just once or twice per second, so you need a very good rhythm. Is that a job requirement for, for service workers to trigger service mode? might work at, with a nuclear reactor, rhythmically raising and lowering the nuclear rods. But the complexity of these traffic lights is, is so high that you that I'm sure you can you can add an Easter egg in there. They have lights, they have those knocking signals. They have internet. I think there's still potential as for the IoT. And they, of course, um, of wireless transmitters, at least in Berlin, the trams can trigger the traffic lights wirelessly. How many megahertz? Well, the, the, the usual suspects. If only there was a way to cheaply get your hands on software-defined radio. If only somebody gave them away. That's probably not going to happen, is it? No, no risk. Not, not from the perspective of 10 years ago. The Internet Normality Update 2016, what we have to say about it is that in 2016, the numbers published are usually from 2015. Flash exploits are now at $100,000 each. iOS exploits at a million dollars each. The FBI paid $1.3 million, but nobody knows if they paid for the exploit or for using the exploit. So OPEX versus CAPEX. If you can't laugh about that, then um, I congratulate you. <laughs> Some desperate souls are clapping here. Bug bounties. Google paid two million last year, which is as much as in the two or four years combined that preceded it. And Apple has entered as well. They're pretty late. You also, why are the prices on the gray market as high as they are now? I think it's because ransomware Trojans, which we explained about last year, switched from market exploit marketing to business to consumer, business to business, which to business to consumer, because now you can get money from everyone. And I think that's because I think the prices climbed because the monetization of a usual exploit chain 
works pretty well these days. We'll come back to that later. Back to numbers, bugs in the Linux kernel have apparently have an average lifespan of five years. We don't have any numbers for other code. We have no figures for other code. Yeah, you should you should turn off more things. We see that open source is brilliant. It's just a fact free of any any value attached to it. But the code that's being rolled out now. I'm going to flatten this now and turn it all off. Hmm. We have a security nightmare right on the stage, it hmm. seems. Hmm. Hacker Jeopardy being whistled again in the audience. <laughs> Old evergreens never die. Do you know how you call something like this? Resilience. <laughs> You can do your intermission music yourselves. No technology needed. So cyber damage has um, amounted to 18,000 euros per year instead of 10 euro, 10,000 years last year. Insurance money is insurance premiums are rising. And the wire transfers that are being executed by Trojans. Dridex seems to have caused a damage of $10 million and single transfers amounted to up to $2.1 million. And the only thing that surpassed them was phishing or CEO tricks. Mattel, the company that makes Barbie, got a new CEO and somebody impersonated that new CEO and trans $3 million were transferred. So online crime is definitely a field of expertise that needs a wide array of talent. And this was only beaten by the figures from the SWIFT hacks, where apparently an entire billion dollars of the central bank of Bangladesh somehow went missing. And they cleaned up and um, got their money back. So apparently there's quite a lot going on there and um, eventually only $81 million was missing. German figures, 4% are victims of identity theft, 8% fell victim to phishing, 15% use ad blocking. Apparently a third of those aged 18 to 24. How many in this room use ad blockers? <laughs> all hands, all hands just went up. Yeah, I think that's probably a hundred and one percent. Who of you had to install an ad blocker for their parents at Christmas? Who had to disable it because they would have got no cake otherwise? Uh, three of you. <laughs> One question, though, who of you uses more than one level of ad blocking? 10%. You're at the. You're the, way ahead. You're way ahead. You're the future. Mm -hmm. Ad banner click counts are fake. Download counts are fake. Ratings are fake. News is fake. When someone calls you from Microsoft, it's fake. 
Dell is fake as well. The one on one ISP guy isn't really working for that company. Who have you got called by the telecom company and uh, got told that you have a virus or know somebody who got a call? Yeah, I always expected. No, I, I got my first real mail from PayPal this year. And I only did, <laughs> I only failed to delete it by accident. And I thought, oh, this is really well done, and wanted to keep it as an example of how how um, real phishing looks these days. And it took me a while to figure out that it actually was a real email. And I recently saw a screenshot of a UPS mail, and the real UPS mail is completely indistinguishable from phishing mails. It says click here to download something and it's really incredible, surprising. The question, the, the thing that I wonder is why is this support call thing not worse in Germany, not not as bad in Germany as it is in the United States. Later knows, and I think it's because we speak German. And if you can't make these calls in German, then you are not going to get people on the phone who believe what you what you're trying to tell them. And we have high hopes for real-time translation software industry. Well, something that we translators don't like, of course. Zero days that are that have been in use, that have been observed in the wild, were the same in 2013 and 14, and they doubled in 2015. So it's more worthwhile these days, apparently. And aren't they being sold to governments first? Or didn't the governments really know how to pay for them in 2015? I believe that, you know, considering how much how much a ransomware campa campaign gets you, it's, it's, it's just it's more worthwhile more. and it's not quite as morally objectionable. One more theory could be that the first wave is uh, is completely ignored. Nobody notices it. it notices it. it. It's against political dissidents and whatever. Nobody notices that. And once that's over, it's it's used against everyone. We don't really know. If you know more about it, please tell us. E government. Data wealth, crypto, voters registers. Many voters registers were hacked this year. 93 million Mexican, 55 Mex million Philippine, and 49 million Turkish voters. And that was a complete attack on on all the voters in the in the database. And one one of them was a was a MongoDB, <laughs> one of the 35,000 open databases that are not properly secured was apparently one of those. And of course, there's quite a lot of data attached to that. And you can see that her, the her government always told us that data is the oil of the 21st century, and you can see the this cooperation between e government and data richness. So the more data the government collects, the more data wealth there can be, unless they don't have a proper backup strategy. I think there was a survey. Did you have a computer incidents, yeah, why, how many, and then they asked whether or not companies classified their data, and 64% of companies didn't, 
and just 52 percent of companies had no problems with backups, which is those who never tried if they can actually restore their backup. So, when one or two years ago I was changing my phone provider and they said you'd have first to prove that it's really you and I said, yeah, that's me, this is my date of birth. And they said, sorry, you can't verify that. Why can't you verify my date of birth? Well, we sadly lost it, <laughs> right? Not bad. Perhaps you had a neighboring customer called Johnny Drop Table. Yes, that then, then there was the election computer massacre. Election computer, voting computers still haven't gone. And you get the impression that this is the asbestos of democracy in certain places. It's here now, some people thought it was a good idea and those that didn't immediately rip it out, they just can't get rid of it anymore. And there's a certain inertia there, and the dynamics isn't quite clear to me, but the only hope that I have is that, as with asbestos and building sites, uh, the, there was a huge problem there, and now it's routine. So perhaps voting computers will be dismantled and replaced by paper, and that might become routine as well. Right. That, again, is e-government in the sense of procurement. Uh, the FBI's of this world that like to look at telephones, which, of course, has been dealt with in breadth. And, uh, we don't have to ex uh, add to this here at Congress. No, it was enough, right? And the whole thing that happened to the Democratic Party. Actually, we should perhaps say something about that, uh, because what that actually means, what, what happened there this year, is that that's that the function of IT security in an organization, a political organization that has secrets, that determines these days how many secrets this organization can actually have. And what was it, the risotto recipe? or some real secrets, whether the, it's one or the other doesn't really matter. It just, you just look at, at the way that this hack happened with these various mails. It wasn't rocket science. Um, rocket surgery was the word used. So it was the lower class of Trojans. But the interesting thing, I think, is if you see to, to to observe how they respond, the things that in the email will be leaked uh, or will get you know lost somehow. That's clear. And then do you then switch to SMS? Sorry, code books. Yeah, okay, they are kind of bulky, you lose them, they're not really that useful in everyday life. They can't really do without having secrets, so the only way forward maybe could be that. We'll have to see. What is conspicuous if data always gets lost and you look at these cases and say, wow, that's, uh, this is <laughs> the error registers just got lost and uh, there's a, sorry, the, the electoral registers got lost and not contain not just first name, surname, address, uh, ID number, social services number, date of birth, but also the parents' names, not in Germany, but anyway. So you ask yourself, how much data do these people actually have? and how much data do other people have and uh, how have they got lost as well and you then realize that this data wealth is a very asymmetric thing many people out there have data about us and we don't know and if we do know or have a rough idea then still it's in no way tangible or understandable to, to the individual in in no way understandable or 
uh, and you need examples like someone going away and and what Malte Spitz did get together with a journalist and use the whole telecommunications retention data to actually visualize what this actually really means. And what I'm missing there is this feedback function, which brings us back to the, the call for a data resume or data statement, which we'll have to, I think, uh, redo. All the data that authorities have about me should be sent to me in a letter every year. In that context, another very refreshing thing was the thing about asking data from the state first or second day, I think. The asking the police register what they have about me, that was in, in a talk. And uh, yeah, iPhone error 53, who heard about this topic? That was the, um, okay, who was affected or know someone who was affected? Okay, oh, a few. So that was the topic, the issue that the newer iPhones have this touch ID, the, the fingerprint sensor, and if you replace that, it has to be recoupled with the rest of the crypto hardware because uh, because it, it's part of that trusted chain that is established. And that is something that the non-Apple stores cannot do. And that is remarkable because we have cryptography here and device security preventing swapping parts and that will surely become more frequent. More and more devices consist of several components and if these components are security relevant, uh, which in case of smartphones is more or less everything, the touch screen as well, for example, where you enter your password, so this coupling of components within the device will surely increase. There's a clear trend there, and that will mean that only the authorized workshops that have the software by the manufacturer or the, those that have the reverse engineering box from China will be able to uh, perform this coupling after swapping components. And we see the same thing with cars. Cars have tons of, sen tons of sensors in them as well. And some of these sensors are so good that they are under export controls, such as fast infrared cameras with a high frame rate. And they then have to be connected to that car. Electronically, they can only be allowed to con con communicate with a certain onboard computer. So you have to have a whole, perform a whole charade of security procedures to uh, uh, after a, a swap. So that that's really interesting. It, it will become interesting, car Trojans. So, speaking of ransomware, as we've returned to that, because uh, as, an ran as a ran ransomware author, you of course have to consider where your priorities lie, of course. What's worth getting active and it's worth where you can, uh, it's worth it where you can get lots of data or take lots of data ransom. And uh, the uh, device that you capture maybe it's very expensive that might be another reason where people don't just go off and say okay i'll park my car at the next corner and walk away and buy myself a new one and if you then just can't rip out the main board and put a new one in then you'll have to pay uh, if, if i if i was writing such a car trojan i would prevent people from locking their car You can then consider different variants, uh, add an app to this that tells me where the cars are and surely uh, immediately you have an instant car sharing business. Yes, your car is now delivering pizza until you've paid me. Well, autonomous cars 
is it your autonomous car or someone else's? The question, of course, is if it's autonomous, then it belongs to itself, hopefully. And the question is whether a steering wheel lock or a, a tire clamp is uh, uh, taking away freedom, re robbing it of its freedom. So uh, this ransomware thing surely has a lot of potential still. We'll come back to that. I think the ransomware, we had it last year, I think we said it, but that is a really broad field. And it's very interesting to see how people deal with it. Uh, this ransomware topic encrypt your computer all right but nothing's really happened there yet because the transaction paying the ransom how does the average person get hold of bitcoin and the evil guys have a certain support hotline i think what they do what i would do i don't know i think i would the I would buy, build the easiest operable Bitcoin exchange ever. Uh, insert your 10 euro note here and you have a Bitcoin coming out there and you can Im immediately enter your Trojan's address in there, right? And paste it in. And the if, if you would then run this yourself as a ransomware operator, uh, you would have plausible den deniability and on top of it, the cash in your pocket immediately. Ooh. Right, so um, the new dimension there surely was you can't pay, no problem, just send this Trojan to two friends and if they then pay, right? And of course you're laughing but that is incredibly perfidious if these people then start thinking whom they should how they should compose this email so that the victim on the other side actually clicks on the thing i first read the headline and thought what i have to infect two people in order to get disinfected and my get my data back have i got have an if I have registered my own domain, I have as many friends as I want. And uh, then I read on and said someone will have to pay at the end. I thought, well, uh, but fortunately, the Facebook people have so many friends. Right. Okay. But on a positive note, let's encrypt. Applause. Exactly. Remarkable, notable things, 2016. We'll have to rush through that a bit. There was this mirror thing that closed the port behind it. In fact, close the port. Great until the next reboot. This was another nice thing. Someone whose smartphone was stolen bought a new one, infected it with a Trojan and let someone steal that and all the data that was then uh, retrieved from the Trojan or surveillance software uh, was he captured that and uh, made something out of that and surely that helps with visualizing what happens if your own telephone has Trojans in it, just to make it all more understandable and visible. Macro viruses still aren't dead. On the contrary, they are coming back. We were thinking why, and it's probably because, well, what has the macros in Word documents in your everyday work life? I was looking at that. There, I have my own VM for that to run those. It's remarkable. It's surprising how the, the reason, of course, is that someone's heart is in that, and people that solve problems with Excel macros to just you know upgrade away from them you would need people and time and, and write migration scripts so that's why macros will not die it just won't go away zigbee who of you has zigbee at home come on 
Nein, nein, warte einen Moment. Hang on. Hang on. Who of you has a Philips uh, smart smart light bulb? Does anyone know anyone who has? Yeah. So people do have Zigbee at home. So that creeps its way through the, the light bulb sockets. Is that a zombie technology? That uh, an undead thing? But we had an. A, wonderful export from for that this year uh, an exploit uh, a nice vulnerability and uh, that spread things from them one to the other and they had a very nice idea about spreading just uh, have a relatively strong ziffy transmitter put that on a drone and fly the drone down the street and the nice thing about that is that you can't then just do normal blinking lights but rgb blinking lights so, we found it remarkable that the Mal Malware Museum on archive.org that exists there, uh, well, it's kind of de de defused malware. Yeah. But uh, they also provide the DOS emulators to watch the to watch uh, the rootkit doing its job. And that was an interesting story and quite inspiring as well. Samsung has that um, little problem with, <laughs> with the phones that turn into cyber physical systems of themselves. So they had an exothermic influence on their surroundings and they had to recall them. And they recalled them, but uh, not all of them came back because people liked them, thought, mm, mine's not going to explode, is it? And they started tightening the screws then. So they uh, reduced the maximum charge to 80 percent, and uh, people get a, got a warning. And after the next update, they reduced to 60 percent. Finally, they completely disabled charging, which essentially turned phones into bricks and um, was supposed to get people to bring them back to the store, which of course raises the question of whether or not you actually own the device or somebody else does. And I thought this would be nice to turn into a ransomware Trojan. A Trojan just goes along and reduces the maximum charge to 60% and doesn't do anything else. Uh, it's a pity we didn't hear that. Apparently, a very clever remark. Someone from the audience thought that might that would be Apple's strategy. And yeah, getting the cash is always a problem with ransomware. But the only thing you need to do is to sell an app on the App Store that then tells your phone to charge to 100% again. That's the only. That's that's a very simple way to to get money from ransomware. So it's at the end of the day, it's remarkable because it's going to happen more frequently. This will not have been the last time that this is something you have to do as a manufacturer to avoid ridiculous legal risks. Any of you remember Configure? When when was that? 2006, somebody thinks. It was a bit later, in fact. Yeah, something like 2008, 2009. And it's still not dead. And it made its way all the way to the nuclear power plant at Grundremmingen. Applause for that. An achievement. But of course, there was no no threat to society in any way. Packet drones or parcel delivery drones, the flying things, a quadcopter with a parcel underneath that. So we've had that for years. But what's new is something that just rolls along the pavement and delivers parcels to your to your home. Yeah, there were pilot projects in Berlin, and Hamburg, and if did you see the articles written about it? They were amazing. They found out that if the drone creeps along the pavement and small children start just riding them, wow. 
And the first thought that came into my head was, do I still have enough copper, ca copper cable to build a box for it? No, it's not a Faraday cage for drones. It's my, it's my uh, rabbit cage, officer. Why am I? Why I'm standing on this trap door? No, that's just that's just that's not a not a pit for drones. It's just um, I don't know sewer cover, the sewage, sewage cover, sewage cover. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and the this was impressive as well. I don't know how many of you heard. It just went through the news that the lorry that plowed into the crowds at Breitscheidplatz in Berlin stopped earlier than a normal lorry would have done because it had an accident warning system. And I think that this is something that should enter into the history books because it's probably the first time that a robot prevented or prevent worse things or from happening hindered. at an attack. Yeah. And these braking systems are now mandated in the European Union for newly licensed cars, but it uh, remains to be seen how fast they're going to be retrofitted. 2016, let's look ahead. Hardware is software, you will know that. How are things going to evolve? Who of you knows how many devices they have at home that might benefit from a firmware update at some point or might receive one at some point? 20 people who know how much hardware they have at home with an IP address. So we'll ask them. Who of you thinks that it's fewer than 10? Fewer than 20? Fewer than 30? 40? Fewer than 50? So the majority thought it was fewer than 20. And who of you conducted a census last year? And an Internet of Things survey in their own network. Other people called Nmap scan, I think. Who of you had to use force for that? It's increasing, isn't it? Who of you has things that they know need to leave the house? Oh, everyone. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Vorsätze fürs neue Jahr. Maybe some New Year's resolutions there. The technological debt that probably your, your kids' tablets or your grandparents' tablet computers. How many of those have a battery, a rechargeable battery? Who has devices that have both a battery and an IP address? All the others are lying. Does your insurance know about that? All of them are now kinetic actors. Or dormant cyber pathogens. Good pronunciation of pathogen on the stage there. I had worse. And I learned an interesting thing at Congress. You all know the um, those hoverboards that people use, and they have this interesting reputation of <laughs> uh, having uh, spontaneously combusting and. Uh, I was told this is a problem in mechanical manufacturing. It's a product that matures at the customer's place, and you should unscrew it first and um, remove all the small manufacturing defects, and afterwards it's perfectly safe. So it's as simple as that. 
This is something that made us wonder if the auto update, auto update religious wars had, were over, or are they still are they yet to come? Did we only think that they happened? The question of whether something should have enabled auto update by default. Who of you thinks that things that are being shipped in standard consumer electronic stores should have auto updates enabled by default? That's the majority. More or less everyone, I think. Everything needs an off switch. I, I agree with that. I think for 2016, we can assume that this auto update war, the religious war, should be over. DHCP doesn't always work, but hey. So, how do I recognize whether or not it works beforehand? I think that security updates should be not just enabled be compulsory. by default. They ha should be compulsory, in fact, and they should be separate from feature updates. So, I don't like. Um, I would prefer that I can choose whether or not I install things that disable functionality or spy on me. And of course, it's not always easy. I did different things on my router than just routing IP packets and suddenly Telnet was gone with a security update. Of course, that's no joke, but hey. The next step is going to be putting it on the packaging, labeling them clearly that this product is best before And this corresponds to the time that you have for security update, the, the time frame in which security updates are going to be provided. But this is going to be interesting in the details. I spoke to a Russian security researcher this year, and that was quite interesting. I said, you patched something in your product. Why is there no security bulletin about that or whatever you call it? Well, it wasn't. It was not a bug in our code. No, just the Tomcat that we used. Oh, right. And I need to know that you hid a Tomcat in there. And this kind of thing, it's it's going to be interesting. It's not. No, it's not my code. Only the twenty-three thousand libraries that I'm linking to. Yeah, it works for you, right. <laughs> and it gets worse, or it will do. Things that think, DDD in German, the acronym for the German words for things that think, TTT in English. So things that claim to think for you. Well, we are talking about things now. No. Is there an analogy hidden in there somewhere? In politicians that claim or think to be thinking for me? I can't quite think of anything. Uh, so these neural network thing, perhaps. And that's where things do get funny, because you, if you can't get around them because they're built in and you can't patch them away or disable them or neutralize them in any other way. For a few years ago, we had this, this flood of stickers on the Congress, warning stickers for the 21st century, and in there you had contains AI, that was nice. So we have contains internet we need, contains cloud, contains AI. Are you listening? No, listening to you. Contains cyber. Contains cyber. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 
just as an announcement for people that uh, can bother about correlation attacks and so for nanosecond time stamping on hundreds of gigabit traffic throughput that is the norm these days so everything with low latency uh, that it gets a bit tight everything that needs low latency it's not funny the, that leads us to the technology that is there and, and that can examine things gets keeps getting better and uh, what's there gets, keeps getting cheaper so the thing that an, an ISP can look at these days just to see whether they and their customers are in the clear still that gets more and more and that gets us to the topic of asynchronicity uh, of collecting data and the fact that you know so little about what the others know about yourself and the debates we had before I don't want to know what my ISP can know about me wouldn't it be practical if there was such a pop-up with the ISP telling me that from my network devices would want to log in to some company that went bust four weeks ago and the cloud has gone and you know on the other hand these data are being collected yet again if that happens and then when the ISP gets into trouble we'll sell it on I don't know so what we will see in 2016 or 17 as well what we will see in 2017 is ad blocker blockers turning into reality tunnels because we have a content filtering engine in our main data stream and we can use that to do other things than just filter out ads these comments are something no one knows to read for example superfluous sport news something no one needs and that's how it starts you begin and I believe if you look ahead a bit not just one year but the next I think ad blockers are becoming better and better that's which is why we need ad blocker blockers and these then have to become intelligent so we have a distributed machine intelligent intelligence that blocks our ad blockers and then on the other side you will see AI getting used as well which uh, so these are trying to circumvent the blocker blocker blockers or what so we have different intelligences AI is asking fighting for our attention and that concludes in well hey have you seen this funny coca-cola ad what coca-cola ad hey Siri show me that coca-cola ad from yesterday I'm sorry Dave I can't do that Okay, next page, uh, penultimate, penultimate page or ultimate one, business models, crypto and sports, shadow databases. So one person's emergency is someone else's business model, right? If you have databases floating around and getting lost, data wealth aggregation, so surely someone will get the idea that it would be great to collect all these things and there are a few ones that are among the good ones such as have I been pawned dot com or dot org I don't know where you can check whether your own email address has been lost and who try hard to verify whether the, the data dumps they find on the internet are actually real and of course there's much more happening many things have got lost you know the, the prices for health records in the US have crashed this year down to ten dollars a piece just loses all its value and then surely there's someone who buys all this stuff and well then considers maybe I'll do something with it later and if it's just improved fishing improved fishing mails so the LinkedIn data has this happened to them, right? When did the LinkedIn data get lost? Was it last year? No, this year in May or something. 
they were then used later to send even better phishing mails. The new professions, the IoT device diviner, as we've seen, no one really knows what they have in their home. And well, you may be able to find out, just follow the cables or see if there are some blinking effects somewhere. But people that have no clue, that don't know, could build themselves such a device that to search your IoT devices with. And I'm sure these exist already. These are the bug hunters. They're just increasing their field of occupation and <laughs> who are you going to call? What we also can assume is that storage crypto is just tactical because something is always going to get broken. The random number generator may be bad or the password that uh, secured or stored the phone backup on, on, on the laptop was bad or something's always wrong. So we have to assume until further notice that storage crypto uh, consider storage crypto a, a more tactical thing. So you have a you have a platform such as iOS, and and the exploits for that are worth more than one million dollars by now. And still, it's the case that forgetting your passphrase only compels you to switch it off for a few years or a few months, and and, and then you get back to your data. Just you know, that's just an intermediary thing and if you then see well we deliberately said sorry for crypto here but but those that believe in perfect forward security which does look good at the moment just a hint to those people that your firefox has a function in it to locally store the ssl session keys so why don't you look and see if that's enabled or not it's very, very popular in companies, for example. New sports, digital prepping. We'll leave that for you to figure out. Think about it, preppers, that are those that prepare for the zombie apocalypse with uh, storing dry food at home, generator in the garage. And digital prepping, of course, also includes power supply, right? Uh, photovoltaics. Uh, off the grid that work off the grid or at least uh, usb charges that work this way sure freifunk mesh networks with which you can still watch porn after the zombie apocalypse and the necessary amplifiers for that so digital prepping, I think that sadly includes a YouTube archive, because how today, how would I kill an animal or how do I gut it, the one that I killed today? You won't find that in Wikipedia, will you? Right. And the last item is the fact that we think there are more and more robots, starting with lawnmower robots that are connected to the internet. And well, the question really is drones that maybe deliver parcels or juggle with them. So there is a large area for arts to get involved. Imagine what fantastic corn circles you could do with a, with a reprogrammed lawnmower. Yeah, no. Um, Combine harvester, I think was the word. And uh, okay, and that I think gets us to the end. That's we only overdrew by five minutes, and we wish all of you a happy teardown day. As we said, don't take anything with you that belongs to the building, and have a great transition into 1984.